Father's Day. It's a cool day. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. I want to read you an important, one of the most important passages in the New Testament about society, about the way society is supposed to be structured. See, the problems we have in America today go back to the disintegration of the foundational unit of society, the building block. Hey, welcome back. You've been out of town, haven't you? Yet? You You've been here all along? Oh, okay. Anyway, so, so I want to, I want, this is important. If we would structure our society around the concepts in Ephesians 5, through 6, 4, we would solve about 90% of our society's problems. So it's an important passage if you'll stand for the reading of the word. Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. Minister to it. Minister it to us. Minister to the hearts of the fathers. Help us to see your truth by the power of your spirit, Lord. In Jesus' name. Verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. This is the only scripture that all men know from heart in the whole Bible. So, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. I tell husbands all the time that quote 22, and they say, she just won't submit. I said, it's because she doesn't really believe that you'll die for her. When you love a woman the way Christ loved the church and gave himself for the church, you don't have trouble getting women to submit. Amen? That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love your own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. May God add his blessing to the reading of the word. You may be seated. Fathers, do not bring your children up and provoke them in wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. There are three things that a father has to do. And, and I want to commend you. I look across this room here. It's a great vantage point because I see great fathers. And I see some men in here that weren't really good fathers when they first came in here. And I was not a very good father until I met Jesus face to face. And then when he began to transform me from the inside out, the first conviction, the first thing I was convicted about was not my beer drinking, and I drank a lot of it. It was not my uh, cussing. And I, uh, you know, I could cuss like a sailor if a horse stepped on my foot while I was saddling it was not any of that. My first thing I was convicted about is what, what horrible father I really was. I really didn't know what a father was. I'd confused a father with a taskmaster. And so I, uh, I began to repent, and I began to back up and, and try to, to, to change my relationships with my children. And at that time and in that season of life that I was in, the Lord showed me three things that I had to do as a father. And there's a lot of you, I want to finish that thought, there's a lot of you in here that came to me when you came to this church and you said, I don't know how to be a father, and I said, Jesus will teach you. See, it's not an excuse of a, the generation that had no fathers. They go, I don't know how to do it. Well, you, you know, you, let Jesus teach you. Can I get a witness out of somebody? He'll teach you how to do it the right way. And these are the three things that the God began to convict me about as, as, as I began to really feel conviction about uh, my failure as a father. Number one, he taught me that a father imparts identity and blessing to his children. 
On Israel's deathbed, on Jacob's deathbed, he called his sons together, the 12 of them, and he prophesied over them. And here's one of the examples in, in Genesis 49, 27. He said to his son, Benjamin, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he shall devour his prey. At night he shall divide his spoil. He was telling them, you're a man. I would tell you this, and there's some of you that are raising children and for whatever reason, the father's not in the scene. I'm not trying to make you feel worse, but here's what I want to tell you. Only the man can impart masculinity to the son. A grandmother can't do it. A mother can't do it. Only a man can tell a son he is a man. And that is the number one problem we have in America today. We're going to talk about that in a little while. Part of the rite of passage into manhood is when the father, and we've, we've talked about this ad nauseum, but some of you have never heard me talk about it, but I'm going to tell you the story one more time. A bar mitzvah is when you take the son in the Jewish culture, is when the father brings the son before the rest of the tribe. And bar mitzvah means son of the commandment. What it, what it means is, is he's about to enter into his own spiritual accountability. He's at the age of accountability. And he brings the son before the tribe, and he lays hands on him, and he says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He prays a blessing before the men. He tells the men, the rest of the men of the tribe, this is a male thing. A bar mitzvah is a male thing. And he says, this boy has what it takes. And he declares over him prophetically, he's a ravenous wolf that kills his prey by the day, and divides the spoil at night. This boy has what it takes to get things done. There's a power in that that I can't describe. When I first got this revelation about imparting blessing, well, the father imparting blessing to the son, I came up with this idea back before the drought, and I said, let's go to the Scarborough Ranch. And you, many of you remember, we loaded up, and we took our sons. Was Bradley there? Did Bradley get to go? He wasn't. He was off down the country somewhere. We took our sons to the Scarborough Ranch, camped out down there in Big Alamosetis next to the fishing hole under the, under the cottonwood trees, and, and I, didn't have a, I didn't have an agenda. I didn't know what we were going to do. But I knew at some point in time the Lord was going to call us to bring the fathers to bring the sons before the rest of the men and pray a blessing over them. It was one of the most anointed ministry times I have ever seen in my life. As those men, some of them are not used to praying out loud, took their son before the rest of the men, laid hands on him, and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, and this is why this boy has what it takes. You could feel the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Men's lives were changed. Boys' lives were changed. That day, out under the cottonwoods in Big Alamosetis, in the middle of nowhere, men where they're supposed to be, out in the middle of nature, and God. And, and, and it, was just, it was just an incredible, an incredible time of an imparting of blessing. A father has the power to impart blessing. When Reese graduated, Reese uh, Morris graduated, Carol and I went to the graduation dinner in Lubbock. And l big room they had there, and they had family and friends there. And Roger stood up. And he told a story about Reese when he was little about, you know, where he had kind of failed and he had to talk to him and visit with him and how he marched back in and he faced his fear and, and Roger declared over Reese in front of everybody, the family said, Reese is an overcomer. He's an overcomer. He spoke that prophetically into his life. Now you watch Reese's life. Because his father imparted that to him publicly and declared this is who he is and this is what he is, you watch his life. As things come up and he has challenges, that boy will never quit because he sees himself now as an overcomer. Are you starting to get what I'm saying? Fathers have the ability to impart identity to their children. Not just the sons. We had the, uh, a banquet for the daughters and the the fathers brought the daughters up here and prayed over them and spoke into their life as well. It works both ways. God took Jesus before his ministry started at the baptism in the Jordan River and spoke where the people could hear. One of the few times you will ever find an account in the Bible where God speaks like in an amphitheater where everybody can hear. And he declared this, 
this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He knew that for Jesus to stand up to the trials and tribulations he was about to face, he had to have and feel the blessing of the Father. A father can impart identity to a son or a daughter. In Genesis 49, 28, it says all these, and these are the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is what their father spoke to them, and he blessed them, and he blessed each one according to his own blessing. The identity of the sons who would become the head of the tribes eventually began to become the identity of the tribes themselves. It became generational. See, Reese is going to raise up children that are overcomers. It becomes, it becomes gener what the father speaks into the son. It becomes a generational trait so that the tribes could have been identified by the specific traits that Israel spoke into those, their, his son's life right before he died. We got a lost generation, in our, especially in our males, our young males. What's lost? Their identity. They don't know who they are. And that's why there's so much gender confusion. That's why, that's why there's so much, you know, the society has to embrace a homosexual lifestyle because there's so many of them. And frankly, there's so many of them because they had nobody to speak into their life and tell them that they were a man. I know that sounds simplistic and you don't believe me, but I'm telling you that if, if, if our society was functioning according to Ephesians 5, 22 through 6, 4, this wouldn't be as big an issue as it's become. If you believe that, say amen. Fathers doing what fathers are supposed to do, imparting manhood to their sons and, and to their daughters, telling their daughters they're beautiful, they're desirable, that they're wonderful women. And the other thing about the impartation is the blessing. God showed me that I could lay hands on my children and I could bless them and that the blessing would be irreversible. In Genesis 27, 33 through 35, you know the story. Jacob tricks Isaac, his father, into blessing him instead of Esau, who he wanted to bless, and imparting the, the inheritance to him. And then Esau comes in a few minutes after Jacob has left. He, Isaac is blind. He can't see. But he, Esau, I mean, I, Jacob put on Esau's clothes because he smelled that way, and he put hair on his arm and did all the things so his, he could trick his father into believing that he was E, uh, Esau and his father blessed him and he left and as soon as he left Esau comes in and says father I'm here I brought you some game to eat and it says in the scripture in 27 33 through 35 when Isaac trembled he trembled exceedingly and he said who and where is the one who hunted the game and brought it to me I ate all of it before you came and I blessed him and indeed he shall be blessed when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me also, O my father. But he said, Your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. Now, what I want you to get you to see about is two things. Number one, you've got to remember this. It was God's will that Jacob be the heir anyhow. He gave Rebekah that word. You've got two nations in your womb. One will serve the other. The younger will serve, and they were twins. But, but Esau was born first. And in the primogenitric culture that they had, the firstborn got everything. And the midwife, when, a, when, a, when she had twins in her womb and she stuck her arm out, or, or a baby stuck their arm out, they tied a ribbon on her, tied a string on it, so they would know that was the first one. That was the heir. And so, <clears throat> but God had told Rebecca that the younger will serve, that the, the older will serve the younger. And so I want to point out to you this, this was God's plan anyway. They weren't speaking against God's word. This was his plan anyway. But whenever Jacob, whenever Isaac inadvertently, it's not what he wanted to do, he loved Esau. Jacob was a mama's boy. Study the scriptures. He hung around the tents with his mom all the time. Where was Esau? Hunting. He was a man. He was a man's man. He was out hunting, bringing his daddy game, tending, killing the lion that was messing with the sheep. He was a leader. He was the kind of a guy that men wanted to follow, and Isaac was really proud of him. But whenever he inadvertently blessed Jacob, notice what Isaac said. It's too late. I have spoken it, and therefore it's going to be. Fathers, listen to me. If you don't hear another thing this morning, when you speak over your children, it's released, 
It has spiritual power, and it's what's going to be, and that's a two-edged sword. That thing cuts both ways. Don't speak curses over your own children. Can I get a witness out of somebody? You have the unique authority and power as a father to speak into the life of your children and impart blessing, and when you do, it's irreversible. Study the life of Isaac. I can't do nothing about it now. And he wanted to. He wanted to rescind it and bless the right one. He said, it's too late. I've said it. Fathers, listen to me. When you say things in anger and you spit it out of your mouth, it's too late. Be careful about what you say. You have the ability to impart blessing to your children, and you've got the ability to curse them as well. Proverbs 18, 21 said, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. If you learn that your children become what you speak, start speaking into their lives. Start speaking you're an overcomer. Start speaking you're going to be successful. Start speaking that you're going to have a great career. Start speaking that you're going to be used by God. Start speaking that into their lives. Jeff Copenhaver, when Mandy was pregnant with Dylan, we were having a meeting out here in the barn. That's, we didn't have a sanctuary then. He was preaching that day. He took Mandy, and I'd never seen a guy do this, and he began to speak into her womb. He began to speak into her belly, and he began to speak that God will use you, that, that, that God has gonna, got a plan for you. Before he was ever born, I've seen children who have been rejected by their natural fathers for God knows what reason. And the father speak cursing into, their, into the womb of the mother, and the child is born with a spirit of rejection. Can I get a witness out of somebody? They will plague them all their life that they have to be delivered from. Well, I don't even know who my father was, but yeah, but you have this deep-rooted spirit of rejection that's destroying your life. Well, I don't know where I got that. Probably words that were spoken before you were ever born. Fathers, your words are powerful. Your words are powerful. Measure them. Life and death is in the tongue. He who loves it shall eat of its fruit. You can speak life or you can speak death. Speak life into the lives of your children. The first thing the Lord taught me is I had the anointing and I had the spiritual capacity to speak identity and to speak blessing or cursing into the lives of my children. The second thing the Father in heaven taught me is, is, is I was convicted about the way I had been living. Because I didn't live a, I was, man, I was a hard working guy. I didn't live a, I, you didn't find me in strip joints and stuff all the time. I didn't do that. I was a worker. Man, it's a great place to hide emotionally, isn't it? When things start coming, you know, things are not get, getting too good, getting along too good at the house, man, we just go to the barn, hallelujah. We know where we can hide. We can hide in our work, and I guarantee our boss will give us a raise over it. So that's what we're going to do. Praise God. Amen. The problem with hiding from your emotional problems in your family is, guess what? They don't get better. They don't ever get better. We don't deal with them. I didn't deal with things. What I dealt with is I just went out and just checked cows. Amen. In the meantime, when I, I got saved and I got convicted about about that aspect of my life. What do I do? What do I do? This is what the Lord told me, and I want you to remember this, men. All you have to do is teach the teachings of Jesus and live them. You don't got to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. Learn the teachings of Jesus and apply them to your life. And I'm going to tell you something else, too. Your children don't care one whit about what you say. They're watching you. They're keen observers. They want to see what you do. The values that you have inside of you will be what you will live by, and they will inherit those values. And what is important to you, that's what they will decide is important in life. Be careful of how you're living before your children, because the values that you pick to live by are going to influence your action, and they're going to watch your action, and they're going to make your values become their values. Teach the teachings of Jesus and live them. That's all you have to do. I love Obed-Edom. Man, if you ever get a chance, study the life of a guy named Obed-Edom in the Old Testament. He, he loved the presence of God, and he taught his children to love the presence of God. 
David was trying to move the ark back in 1 Samuel chapter 6 or 7, somewhere in there. He had, he, had, he had become king of all of Israel. He was sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. Everything had been restored. Every prophetic word had come true. There was one thing that was missing, and that was the ark of the covenant, which types the presence of God in the Old Testament. The ark of the covenant had been lost to the Philistines. God struck them with a curse, so they sent it back. It ended up in the house of a of a Gibeonite who was not even a Jew named Abinadab. It stayed there for 20 years. And I'm not going to go into the story now how it ended up there, but for 20 years it had been in Abinadab's house. And David says, if I'm the king and if I'm God's chosen man, then God's presence needs to dwell here in Jerusalem. We need to go get the ark and we need to bring it back. The problem with David was is he didn't consult the priest about the proper order of the presence of God. He mishandled the presence of God. He decided he could build a man-made mechanism. This is the number one problem in church in America today. We come up with a man-made scheme to try to usher in the presence of God. It won't work. If you study, go back in Exodus and study the ark and listen to God's instructions. The ark is to be borne on the backs of the priest. The presence of God is to be borne on the backs of the priest, not by some, not some crafty uh, laser light show, smoke, mirrors, a really good praise and worship band. The presence of God comes on the back of the priest. If you have anointed men leading your church, you have the presence. There's no other way around it. So he goes and sticks this, the ark on an ox cart. Two of Abinadab's sons, Yuza and Ahau, go with them to help them. They turn, make a turn, and the wheel of the cart falls in a ditch, and the ark slips just a little bit. And Ahau reaches up to slide it back over and keep it from falling. And God kills him. God kills him. What the? This is a God of love and mercy? He killed him for the same reason he killed 70,000 in Beth Shemesh when it came back from the Philistines and they just opened it to look into it. It was just a box to them. Now it's been in Abinadab's house for 20 years. This kid's been eating dinner with the ark in the next room. 20 years. 20 years it's been there. In 20 years it just became a box. An ornate box. And when he touched it like it was a box, God struck him and killed him. And, and David jumped back and stopped the procession and didn't know what he had done, but he knew God was, had broken out against them. That was David's term. And he just he stuck it in Obed-Edom, the Gittite's house. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his house. Now, he was a Gittite. What's a Gittite? That means he was from Gath. He was not a Jew. He was a Philistine. What's he doing in Israel? Well, at David's coronation back in 2 Samuel 15, 18, it says all the servants that passed before him, all the Chetherites and all the Pelethites and all the Gittites, 600 men who had followed him from Gath passed before the king. These were a group of men that had joined David when he was living in Ziklag. They were, became warriors in his camp. And he brought them back. When he came back to Jerusalem, he brought these men back from Philistine. They had proven their ability on the battlefield. It's an interesting footnote of history. All of David's personal bodyguards were from this group. None of them were Jews. His personal bodyguards were all either Cherethites, Pelethites, or Gittites, and they were led by a man named Benaiah. And Benaiah was a mighty, mighty warrior. And if you study Benaiah's life, you see that Solomon promoted him to be commander-in-chief whenever he took over as king. These men were trustworthy. They were fierce. They were skilled. But the main thing that they were is they were not Jews. David didn't have to worry about being assassinated by one of them so he could be promoted into his place because he would never be eligible because he was not a Jew. That's why he made them his personal bodyguards. Not only because they had proven their skill on the battlefield. And Obed-Edom came out there and was living in a play, had a little farm, I'm sure, but he was a warrior at heart. And so a man gets killed. Think about this. A man gets killed by God right out there in the street out in front of his house. And next thing he knows, they're up there knocking on his door, unloading that thing in his house. And he doesn't know. He's not a Jew. 
He's, he's, a, he's a Philistine, and he doesn't know what the heck happened, but he knows, I don't know whether I want that thing in my house. But they stuck it in there. And so what does God do to a Philistine living in the wrong country when he's stuck in the house with him? He blessed him for three months. You need to think about this. Why? Why did he kill a man on one hand and bless another? I have a sneaking suspicion that Obed-Edom got on his knees and said, I don't know what you do, God, or who you are even. I just know you're the Lord of the mighty warrior David, whom I have followed in battle many times. And I know that you're powerful. And I don't know what to do. I don't know whether I'm supposed to stand, kneel, throw holy water at you or what. I don't know what to do. The only thing I know to do is do what I've seen David do. The only thing I know to do is begin to worship you. I believe that old man in that house got on his knees and he began to worship the Lord and the Lord began to move. And the next thing you know, his sons start coming in the room. They're watching Obed-Edom. He's worshiping God. They can feel the power and the presence. Next thing you know, all the lambs are having triplets. Next thing you know, they got a better crop, corn crop than anybody else. Next thing you know, the glory's in the house. You drive by there, you can see the glory through the windows. Next thing you know, their whole family is in there. And what do we do? Just worship him. Forget about rules and regulations. I got a feeling that Obed-Edom was blessed because he laid down all the rules and regulations because he didn't know what they were and just said, God, I just worship you. I recognize that you're the king of the universe. And I don't want to do but worship you. Now, the cool thing about Obed-Edom's family is, is that he obviously taught them how to worship. He taught them to cultivate this deep affection for the presence of God. Because if you look in 1 Chronicles 26, 8, when they're setting up the divisions of the gatekeepers, and they're putting people to take care of the ark after they get the ark finally moved in Jerusalem and there's a crew to take care of and watch over the ark. Obed-Edom is right in the mix. And in 1 Chronicles 26, 80, it says, all the sons of Obed-Edom and their sons and their brethren, able men with strength for work, 62 of Obed-Edom's descendants ended up turning the passion for the presence of God into a career. They ended up being involved in the care of the ark. What did he learn? They learned from Obed-Edom. They learned how to worship God. I would love to see fathers in this church teach their children how to worship God. You know what? I don't think you've got to worry about teaching them all the rules and regulations. I think you've got to just teach them how to love God with all of your heart. Teach your children how to love God, how to worship God, how to trust in God. He was blessed for generations. He had great grandsons that were blessed because of his passion for God's presence. And he wasn't even a Jew. And yet here he was, right in the middle of the temple. Here he was in the most sacred place in all of Israel. Obed Edom and all his boys. Man, there's a, there's a, there's something to learn from that. The third and last thing that the Lord taught me. It showed me as I had to learn, love to learn love unconditionally. Ephesians 6, 4, and you fathers don't provoke your children to wrath or bring them up in the training, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. You know, it is true that a father chastens a son. Proverbs 3, 30, 11, and 12. My son, don't despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. The Lord chastens a son, but he judges a sinner. You've heard that all along. And it's our responsibility to chasten our children. But I want to tell you, a little chastening goes a long way. A little chastening goes a long way. Fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. It's a father's responsibility to correct their sons and daughters, but it's also their responsibility to love them unconditionally. And we're just studying and hearing God. Last week was a great chapter. And Dr. Willard said, the essence of love is being with. Being with. If you love somebody, you don't tell them you don't have time for them. If you love somebody, you want to be with them. 
If you love somebody and you're passionate about them, you want to spend time with them. And here's what I'm going to tell you, fathers. You can't chasten your children if you're not spending any time with them. I think the art of fatherhood is more about being involved in your children's lives than being a skilled coach and guide. I think it's about just being involved in their life, being with them. The definition of love is to be with someone. And you can't chasten a child and correct him. If you're missing an action at the football game, if you don't ever take them fishing, if you don't ever spend any time with them, you have to invest in their life. Jimmy Valvano had a great quote. Carol found this in a horse magazine. She said, you need to use this. But he said, the greatest thing that my father did for me is he believed in me. The greatest thing my father did for me is he believed in me. A father can believe in a son or a child or a daughter, and he can express that to them, and it's amazing how far that will go. You know, Rodney and I have talked about this. We've seen, we've seen kids with great athletic ability and talent that are not very successful in athletics. And then other kids that have kind of marginal athletic ability and talent, but they're really successful. What's the difference? Look at their relationship with their father. The one kid that's got all the, got all the attributes, he ought, to be, he ought to be tearing it up. He doesn't know for sure if his father even loves him. And the one kid that has not tall enough, not big enough, not fast enough, but he's always making the plays, there's a kid who's been told by his whole life by his father, you got what it takes. He knows the love of a father. I remember RG3 said this somewhere. I don't know exactly where it was. But they said, what, what do you think is your, and of course by now RG3's had a few problems in the professional deal, but I believe he's going to come back. We said, what's the secret to your success? He said my name. My name's the secret. The sports guy goes, you what? My name. Like the RG? No, the three. I'm a third. I'm a son of a son of a son. I know who I am because I've been raised by a man who knew who he was. And when I step onto the football field, I know I was made for this moment. That's the reason that I'm successful. Wow. Isn't that cool? Fathers have the ability to speak success into the life of their children. 